Romans 13, 1 through 7, ESV. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Well, thank you, Ben. Good morning. My name is Todd Malone. I am the lead pastor here of FVC, and it is great to be back together. Um, it's really fun to see all of you folks here, and uh, it was really fun to be here in the 9 o'clock service and see many people here and uh, kind of getting back into classes and so forth, and um, we are doing our best to do all of this very safely and conscientiously, and I hope um, I hope this was good for you this morning. Those of you who are joining us online, we are delighted that you are here as well. Uh, welcome, and um, again, we are pleased that you are worshiping with us online. I want to remind us why we are here, whether it's in person or whether it's online. We are here because of how we are built. Every person is built to be in relationship with God. Every person is built to become more and more like Christ. And we will only find fulfillment, we will only find contentment, we will only find joy to the degree that we live according to our design. And what happens on Sunday morning is an extremely important part of what God does to draw us close into relationship with him and to help us to become more like Christ. And so we come together to connect with God, to become more like Jesus. We listen to God's word. We respond to God's word. We take God's word extremely seriously. And then we come to a passage like the one that Ben just read for us. And I suspect, as Ben was reading that passage, there were two very large groups of people in here. In fact, I would just suspect that everyone falls into one of these groups, maybe both at the same time. As Ben is reading this passage, there is one group that's sitting there thinking, um, wait a minute, wait a minute, there are exceptions to this, this, this can't be right. There have to be exceptions to this. And there's another group that's sitting there going, oh yeah, preach it, Ben. Preach it. Those people really need to hear this. <laughs> yeah, then there's a third group, those that are standing on the stage that are wondering who is going to um, come preach this for me. What I'd like to suggest, though, is that both of those groups are making the same mistake. Both of those groups are looking for a way to get out of actually applying this passage to themselves and taking seriously the implications of this passage for themselves. And the reason that I say I think everyone probably falls into one of those two groups, if not both, is because you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And humanity has a serious problem with being told what to do. We have a serious 
problem with authority. And that is something inside of us that if we are to take seriously that we are to live with God and become more like Jesus has to be addressed in our lives. And Romans 13 forces us to consider that even government authority has a role to play in our relationship with God and in making us more like Jesus. And so my challenge to you is to sit back and take seriously at face value what this passage is saying. Now, for us to really understand what this passage is saying, we have to remember the context as we are, and just for those of you who are joining us for the first time, no, I did not randomly pick this passage to preach this morning. I promise you I would never randomly pick this passage to preach this morning. We are working through the book of Romans, and this happens to be where we are at conveniently as we are moving into an election time. Let's remember who Paul is writing to. The church in Rome had been founded by Jews and had been led by Jews for roughly 20 years. And over that 20-year span, you had Gentiles that had come to Christ and become a part of that church. In AD 49, the Roman emperor Claudius, for absolutely no good reason whatsoever, declared that all Jews were to be exiled from the city of Rome. And that included all the Jews who were in the church at Rome. They lose their houses, they lose their livelihoods, they lose everything. You're out for no reason. And just the government said so. By the time we get to the book of Romans, these Jews are back. We have a new emperor. Guess what his name is? Nero. Time this was written, Nero wasn't fully corrupt, but um, within Paul's lifetime, he would become one of the most corrupt leaders in human history. Paul is writing to a church filled with people who have lost everything. Because of an unjust government. And he gives them these words about submission. Now, here's what Paul does in developing his thought. We're going to work through it this way. In verse 1, he gives the command. And the command is going to be submit. That's actually what the word means. Then, uh, starting the second half of verse 1, going through verse 5... He is going to give, this is why submission to government is necessary. And then he's going to wrap up with some kind of a big picture, practical ways that the Romans should submit to government. So we're going to work through this pretty carefully to try to understand exactly what Paul is saying and what he's not saying. And now to that one large group, let me give you some assurance. When we get to the end of that, we are going to consider your question of, wait a minute, aren't there times to disobey government? Yes, there are. And that's biblical, and we're going to look at that. So I do want to warn you that this is going to be a little bit of a fire hose experience this morning because we are going to look at this passage, and then we are going to do theology. So here we go. Let's start with the command. First part of uh, Romans 13, verse 1, and here is the command right here. It is to be subject, and let me get this working properly. There we go. It is to be subject. The Greek word that is translated be subject is the same word that is used almost always in the New Testament for submit. That's the word. Who does it apply to? No one is left out. Everyone is to submit. Who are they to submit to? Governing authorities in the Greek. That is referring to, or it's actually a collection of words that mean the superior or highest authorities. And most translators would say what he's actually doing there is talking about kind of government in general. Actually, the very way that I'm talking about government this morning. I'm not talking about the government that is over Longview or the government that's over Texas or the government that's over the U.S. or the government that's over... Italy, I'm not talking about a specific government, I'm talking about government in general. And that seems to be what, he's, what Paul is doing here. He is talking about government in general. And so the command is that the, every person must be subject 
to government. Now, just because he's talking about government in general, I just want, I'm going to keep reminding us throughout this sermon, Paul knows that when he writes this, when he says government, they think of a specific example. And what is that specific example? It's in the same town they live in. It's Rome. It's the emperor. It's the one who was just radically unjust to most of the, or many of the people who had been in that church, probably most of the people who had been in that church. And so Paul wants these Christians in Rome to maintain an attitude of humble submission to the government, even this unjust government. And he wants them to take that command seriously, and I'm going to argue that he wants us to take that command seriously as well. And he's going to go on to give two reasons that we must take that command seriously. And the first is because of the origins of government, and he picks that up at the end of verse 1 and carries it into verse 2. Now, it says at the end of verse 1 that government has been instituted, and there are, again, no exceptions to this. Anyone that exists has been instituted by God. The word instituted means that it was assigned by God. It was put in place by God. And again, this includes everything. Verse 2 teases out the implications of that. If government is instituted by God, that means whoever resists government, and resist here means, means to oppose in, in attitude and action. Whoever opposes this authority in attitude and action is opposing God in attitude and action because God is the one who set it in place. And those who oppose government in attitude and action will incur judgment. Every time, almost every time that word judgment is used in Romans, it is referring to God's judgment on people. So it's not just talking about punishment of the government. It's saying God himself will step in and address you who oppose the authority that he has put in place. The Romans need to submit to government because, Paul says in these verses, it comes from God. And government is under God's authority and in an important way, an extension of God's authority. Paul's going to go on to give another reason to submit, and that's the functions of government. And really, there are two kind of two functions that he highlights here, but they're really kind of the different sides of the same coin. And, and the first function is in verse three, and it's really the idea of, of to reinforce and support what is good, right? If if you do what is good, you receive the the approval of the one in charge. And, and good here is talking about that which is like God's character, that which reflects God's character, that which is righteous and holy. And if you are righteous and holy, then the, the function of government is to support that and encourage that among its people. Just as an aside, how do you feel about that terminology that the leader is God's servant. Um, what does that mean for whoever wins this next election? I'll just leave that question floating out there and let you ponder that. So the first thing that government is supposed to do is support godly moral behavior. The second thing that government is supposed to do is it is supposed to restrain that which is wrong. If you do wrong, government is to step in and intervene with its authority. Government is an extension of God's wrath towards that which is evil. Let's remind ourselves what we mean by God's wrath. Because we tend to think of that as God just randomly flying off the handle and getting really upset. God's wrath is the justice, goodness, righteousness of God brought to bear against all that is evil and unjust. 
If God just ignores the atrocities of human history, if God just ignores the evil in our hearts, then God is not a good God. What is it called when God deals with evil and injustice? It is God's wrath, and that's what this is saying. The function of government is to support what is morally good and then to look at what is evil in this world and say, as an extension of God's authority, we will bring justice to bear on that. Okay, so let's name it. Every person in this room and online is thinking, well, government isn't doing these things, so uh, the verses don't apply. Um, I'm going to keep reminding you who is Paul writing to and what was their context. Rome was not the model of justice and goodness. They were not the picture of what it looked like to uphold the character of God and to punish evil. So just keep that in mind. Verse 5 is really just a summary of the necessary, uh, the, the necessity of submission. Therefore, one must be in subjection. Same word he used in verse 1 for that, that elsewhere it as submit. Not only to avoid God's wrath, right? That's just what he was talking about in verses 3 and 4. We need, government has the function of restraining what is evil and supporting what is good. We need, to, uh, we, we need to submit because that's part of what God is doing there. And we need to submit because of conscience. Government is put in place by God and authorized by God. And if we go against government, our conscience should bother us. That we are going against something that God has put in place. I think it's also interesting the words he used right here, one must. It is a declaration in the Greek that you have an obligation. You are obliged, presumably to God, to be in subjection, to submit to government. Let's hit the pause button for a second. What have verses 1 through 5 said about government? They have said that it is under God's authority because God's the one who appoints it. It is appointed by God to fulfill his purposes. Specifically, his purposes are to support that which is good and to restrain and stop that which is evil. Another way of saying that is his purpose is to see his character reflected in our society. Now, there are some implications of what he said about government. One is because government is under God's authority, I never, ever want to elevate government to the same level as God. It is under his authority. Let me give you a practical implication of that. My hope is not tied in any way whatsoever to the outcome of an election. Ever. Ever. I will advocate for what I think is right and best in the person that I think is right and best to lead. But if my person doesn't win, God has not stopped being the authority. And I will not despair. I will ask the question, God is in charge. What is he doing here? How is he at work? And how am I faithful to him in the midst of that? Let me share one other way that I will not elevate government or country to the role of God. And this one is going to be more controversial. What is supposed to happen on Sunday mornings? We are supposed to come here and focus on who God is and respond to him in his word. Who is, what is the centerpiece of what is happening on Sunday morning? It is God. That is why I resist anytime someone comes to me and says, you know, we really should do a focus on America Sunday for 4th of July. We really should dedicate the entire service to Memorial Day or Veterans Day. Now, I think it's important that we celebrate those things. I think it's important that we celebrate those things as a community of believers. 
right? They're an important part of our lives. But if I make them the point of Sunday morning, I have just put government or country in the place of God. Does that make sense? The Bible has a word for that. It is idolatry. And you can do it very well-meaning. But in my personal conviction, that is why we will not do a 4th of July, God bless America, Sunday service. Because at that point, I think we're risking of putting government at the same authority, the same level of God. How do we actually submit in practice? Paul identifies four things in the last two verses. It's really four things that are under kind of two different categories. And it has to do with our finances and it has to do with um, our allegiance. He says, because of this, you also pay taxes. Authorities are ministers of God. I-R-S... Um, the best way to translate ministers of God from the Greek is ministers of God. <laughs> Taxes. What is he talking about there? He's actually not talking about the sort of things that we think of when we think of taxes. That's actually what he's talking about when he says revenue. Taxes are something different. The taxes, the word that's used there, refers to a specific tax that only applied to part of the population. If you were part of a civilization, a country, a community that had been conquered by Rome or had become a part of Rome, then you paid special taxes for the privilege of being a part of Rome. We would call that taxing someone based on ethnicity or national origin, and we would call that discrimination, and we would call it wrong. Let me give you what this would be like. Texas used to be its own sovereign entity. It is now a part of the United States. This would be Almost exactly like the United States saying, Texas, because you are now part of the United States, for that privilege, I am going to tax, the country is going to tax Texas and Texas only for the privilege of being a part of the United States. Oh, you don't live in Texas anymore? Doesn't matter. If you're a Texan, you're taxed. For the privilege of being a Texan, a part of the United States. How long do you think that would last? <laughs> That's what he's talking about. Pay taxes. To them who it's owed. Respect and honor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those two words are actually... <clears throat> very closely related. Let me just kind of clear out the screen and highlight them here. Very closely related. Paul is, is, is actually saying that just because someone is in a leadership position, they are to be treated with special deference. What he's actually doing is he is pulling from their culture. This was a very, very common cultural value of that time. If someone was part of the Roman Senate, for example, you would honor that person even if you disliked that person, if you disagreed with that person, if you disagreed with their policies. The fact that that person was a part of the Roman Senate meant even if you disliked that person and what they stood for, they deserved your respect. And the Holy Spirit takes what is in that culture and puts it right here in Scripture. And says our attitude must be deference, respect 
just because someone is in that position. Our obligation to government is to support with our resources and to support with our respect. So let's try to summarize what Paul is saying. Government is God's creation. It exists because he appointed it. It exists to reinforce a godly ethic of right and wrong. And as a result, we are to support government according to the financial terms it sets. And we are to treat government officials with a high level of respect. Let's pause again. Before we start trying to qualify this passage away with all the exceptions... Let's recognize that this is God's word inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was written to people who lived under a government that is far worse, far more corrupt, far more unjust than probably anything any of us have ever experienced. Paul expected them to take this passage at face value and live it. And the same is expected of us. We need to consider that this passage, as written, without qualification, should affect how we live. Now, in my lifetime, in this country, I and many others of you in this room have lived under one of the most absurd, inane laws in human history. What sane, reasonable government declares to its population that the speed limit is 55 miles an hour? If you are too young to know what that was like to drive 55 on, on I-20, ask someone who's actually lived it, but be prepared for tears. The number of people in this country who were happy about a speed limit of 55 could fit into a food truck. <laughs> and I promise you, they would be complaining about the speed limit after that food truck had been driving no more than 20 minutes. I hated this law, but Romans 13 required that I respect the law. The people who enforced it need to be respected, and I needed to support government by paying my tickets. <laughs> so having taken this passage seriously and without qualifications, we need to acknowledge that many, many, many people in Scripture without using the same words, have essentially echoed what the Apostle Peter said to the high priest in Acts 5. We must obey God rather than men. We also need to remember that the same person, the Apostle Paul, who wrote Romans 13, wrote several of his letters from prison because he disobeyed government. So clearly Romans 13 is not supposed to be the entire story. But we need to think carefully about how people who take Romans 13 seriously engage in acceptable civil disobedience. Now, I want to be really clear here that this is Todd. It is not God. <laughs> These are my thoughts. They do not carry the weight of scripture. But I'm going to suggest disobeying government becomes appropriate when government does one of these four things. And there are probably more. These are just four that stood out to me. When they prohibit what is clearly biblically required. An example of that in scripture is in Acts 5. Right? The high priest told Peter and the apostles, don't preach Jesus. What does Peter do? He says to them, we're going to preach Jesus. And they beat him, let him go, and he goes and preaches Jesus. Kind of the flip side of that, when, when government commands what is clearly biblically forbidden. Think of a biblical example of that. Shadrach, Shadrach Meshach, and Abednego. Right? Government says, you will worship this idol. 
They say, no, we won't. And they don't. I think examples of those first two are found in the world today. Right? Communist countries all over saying, you will not worship Jesus. There are Muslim countries that say, it is illegal for you to worship any God other than our God. Third one, this is the one you all knew I was coming to. You're all voting for it, rooting for it, is at some point government does in fact reject its Romans 13 functions. Right? It stops supporting godly character and it stops addressing and restraining evil character. Many Old Testament prophets, maybe most Old Testament prophets, this is exactly what they are dealing with with the governments of their day. And if you remember a few years ago, we went through the book of Micah. And Micah is exactly that. That God's people are prospering. The nation is prospering. But they are corrupt. And Micah says, goes to the government and says, you are corrupt. And this success is going to come to an end. You must deal with this. I think an example of that that we see in our time is North Korea. Right? There's an entire population of people, an entire nation of people that live in oppression and poverty. While a very few enrich themselves. What if a nation becomes or a government becomes unjust? And by unjust here, I'm talking more about towards a subset, maybe even an individual within that country or in that society, or maybe a subset, right? Don't you see this in the book of Esther with Queen Esther, right? This, she's, she is the queen of Persia and Persia is doing just fine. The people are doing just fine. But the government says, basically, we're going to wipe out the Jews. One segment of that population and we're going to treat them unjustly. And Queen Esther steps in and says, can't do that. Any example that you can think of, of slavery, for example, in any place that has existed or exists today, because it does exist today, is an example where you've got a part of the population that is being treated unjustly. So, how serious does it have to be before I actually step up and, and obey? And I'm suggesting three thresholds. Before I say this, let me just make one other point about those biblical examples I just gave. Did you notice something that all of them had in common? Every one of them submitted to government by being willing to accept whatever the consequences government had to give them. And I think as we stand up and say what you're doing is wrong, there's still a way that we submit to government by saying, and I will accept the consequences of standing up and saying this. What's the threshold? How bad does it have to get? And this to me, I've really been trying to think through this as it comes to FBC. And things like quarantine orders and not being able to meet and mask orders and stuff like that. And, you know, what, how bad do some of these things have to get before I say we, we, need to, we need to engage in civil disobedience? One of the things I think is important is whether or not there's any consideration that government is making for the common good. Right, so we won't take our example. We'll take an example that has a little more emotionally distant for us. In 1918... You had a massive influenza epidemic. And in 1918, many, if not all states that were around at that time, basically said to churches, you need to stop meeting. And churches pretty much universally complied. Because they looked at it and said, their motive for doing this is actually to protect the citizenry at large. And so we will be willing to comply with that. But another part of it is really important. Are Christians being made a special case? That was the other thing that was important in the 1918 epidemic. Churches looked around and they said, you're not just singling out Christians. 
Because theaters were also closed. Other public gatherings were closed, schools and so forth. So this wasn't just that we're picking on you because you're followers of Christ. This is a strategy that we have for our nation that we think is the right strategy. Here's the last one, and this was the one that I give a lot of thought to personally. I'm calling sustained effect. And the question is, is this temporary or is this long-term? When we are placed under quarantine, first off, let's be really clear here. The church never made the decision not to meet because of pressure from government. Churches were always given the freedom to meet. Always. That decision was made because we believed it was the best way to protect the health and well-being of our people and the people around us. That's why. But what if it had been a mandate? The government had said, we are not going to allow you to meet. At that point, I would have asked a question. How long do I expect this to go? If this is short term, for the sake of the public good, I can... I can do this. But if this is long term, if this is the new norm, there is a clear command in Scripture that we are to meet, gather together. There are clear commands in Scripture that we are to sing together because it is a part of education and encouraging one another. These are clear commands of Scripture. And if you're telling me the new norm is I cannot obey Scripture... At that point, I would go to the, to the board and say, we have to talk about what civil disobedience looks like in this case. Because we are being prohibited long term. This is no longer just about the common good. This is now about the ability for us to be obedient to God. Does that make sense? What would my goals be? My goals would be, I want to obey God. Right? In the case of being told that we can't meet, I, I can't live the Christian life obediently in isolation, in quarantine. I need to be able to meet with others. So, so part of me glorifying God by being obedient to him is going to require that I be able to do the things that he asked me to do. The other thing, and I get this terminology from a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a pastor in Germany during... World War II and was actually executed because he was involved in a plot to assassinate Hitler. What Dietrich Bonhoeffer said is there comes a point when the church must become the conscience of the nation. When the church must recognize that the nation is so far gone in terms of doing what is right and what is wrong that it must step in and become the conscience of the nation. And that would be my other goal. And by trying to be the conscience of the nation, that means I'm trying to pull them back to the character of God. And so that means that how I would do whatever civil disobedience would be, would be, to, would be done in a way that reflects the character of God, which means it wouldn't be mean-spirited, it wouldn't be condescending, it would be loving. And I would also be willing to accept the consequences of whatever I did. We look at this list of when to obey and what the threshold is, and here's the problem. You and I, if we're honest, look at this list as this is my way out of obeying Romans 13. There's a part of us that struggles with that. The way we should be looking at this list is that this is an extremely high bar for not submitting to government. We have a clear command of scripture. And my disagreeing with government does not meet the criteria of this list. So when I get an order that says, or I get the recommendation or whatever that says we are to quarantine, my default response is, I will submit. Now, let me Take that order, this list. Are they asking me to do something that is clearly biblically required? Well, actually, yeah, they are prohibiting me from doing something like that. So I'm going to need to go down to the threshold. 
Are they commanding me to do something that's biblically forbidden? No. Are they rejecting the Romans 13 functions? Not clearly. Are they unjust? Well, they seem to be applying this to everyone, so I can't really make that case. But I do have a case that, that, that what they are prohibiting me of is biblically required. Are they doing this because they are concerned about the public good? Yes. So maybe I need to give them some grace. Are they making a Christians a special case? No. Although apparently in California that may be happening. Which means I might be responding very differently in California. Are they asking me to make this the new norm for how we live the Christian life? No. I have every reason to expect that this is going to be short term. If it turns into long term, at that point I'm having a conversation with our board. So here's the principle that I take away. Our relationship with government starts with submission. I think what Paul is doing in Romans 13 is saying this is your starting point. This is the default. There are going to be plenty of reasons that you are going to encounter that you are going to have to disobey government, that you're going to have to not submit to government. But the default starting place must be an attitude of submission. Our government is asking us to do some things right now that we have never experienced before. And what I want to take away from this passage is not, here are the ways that we might be able to not apply it to our lives. But to think carefully that God has been clear in scripture about wanting us to have an attitude of submission. And so as government asks us to do things that we've never been faced with before, we need to ask ourselves, what is our attitude about their authority? Are we being humble and respectful? And if we disobey, is it clear that they are asking us to do something or not do something that violates Scripture? And is it clear in Scripture that we are either commanded to do it or prohibited from doing it? And are we willing to fully accept the consequences of our disobedience as part of our submission? The point Paul is making is that we are required to respect government authority. We see in broader scripture that respect doesn't always mean obey, but we are to respect. I think an implication for us is we need to watch what we say. We need to watch how we say it. Watch what we say about authorities and how we say it even when we disagree. How do we put this into practice? I'm going to challenge you this week to evaluate the messages that you're getting. Let's filter that message against Scripture. One of the best ways you can do that is to rewrite the passage. It helps ingrain it into you a little bit more deeply. But pay attention. In, in, the, in the articles you read, the podcasts you listen to, the people who are around you, the books you read, what message about government are you getting? Are they encouraging you to submit? What is the basis of that? Are they encouraging you to challenge or disobey government? What is their basis for that? And always, 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 we must pray. That God is glorified through our government. As much as we disagree with our leaders, as much as we, as we want to rebel against them, we never have the excuse not to pray for God to be glorified through them. And I think that's a good way for us to close in prayer today. Would you join me in praying that? Heavenly Father, we sit here as a group of people who have different opinions about so many different things in government, in politics, economics, in, our, in just life in general. We are a mixed bag of people. But we are people who are united in this. We want your name to be glorified. 
And Lord, that is what we ask. We ask that through our nation, through our government, that your name would be glorified. But Lord, let us not leave ourselves out. We ask that through our own responses to government, even government we disagree with, that your name would be glorified. Every one of us in this room has to confess that we do not like pe being people under authority. We want to be a law unto ourselves. And we are guilty of that. But Lord, we rest in gratitude and thankfulness that you forgive us and that you take a passage like this and remind us that you are using government, even government we don't like, to draw us closer to you and to make us more like Christ. And we thank you that you can use even corrupt governments like in Rome to do that very work. Lord, may you do it in us this week. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is what we've said about who God is. We can't, we can't miss this. It's obvious, but it's huge. God is sovereign. He is the highest authority. And the authorities that exist underneath him exist at his will. So what is our responsibility, our challenge as we leave here? It is to treat those authorities in word, action, and attitude with the respect that is given to someone that is a part of God's work. You are dismissed.